Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jens Dehner. I am an associate curator of antiquities at the Getty Villa. And uh, I welcome you today, our audience here in the auditorium, as well as uh, our virtual audience on Zoom. It's an actual audience, not a virtual audience. But the viewers watching and tuning in today, welcome to you also. Today's lecture, the gold bust of Marcus Aurelius, and uh, the city of Avanche, or Aventicum, uh, complements an exhibition at the Getty Villa that is currently on view. Uh, some of you, I, many of you have seen it. Um, and if not, I encourage you to do so. The exhibition is called The Gold Emperor from Aventicum and is on view in the second floor of the museum and will remain on view until January 29, 2024. Um, the star of this exhibition, and I shall say right now pretty much the star of the entire Getty Villa, is the bust, the gold bust of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, uh, visiting us from Switzerland on a really rare and special occasion. Uh, we get to host uh, the spectacular bust, which is not unique but exceptional uh, among Roman portraits and especially is a, such a well-preserved image of one of the, uh, we should say, best known of the Roman emperors, um, Marcus Aurelius, obviously also um, the person known as the Stoic philosopher, as the author of the Meditations, perhaps, to many of you. So use the opportunity while it is here and uh, see it in person, and enjoy the focused exhibition around it. We will hear, of course, more detail about it in today's lecture. Now, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to today's speaker, Denis Jeancan. Dr. Jeancan is an archaeologist with a double specialization in Roman and Islamic archaeology. He has conducted extensive fieldwork around the world, I want to say, in Syria, Jordan, other parts of the Middle East, Central Asia, and also in Ghana and in Switzerland. He has published widely on early Islamic Syria and has taught at the universities of Geneva and at Princeton. He is currently the director of the Archaeological Research Center and Roman Museum in Avanche, Switzerland. Please join me in welcoming Denis Jancan. Thank you very much, Jens. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. As just has been announced, I will give my lecture today about the archaeology of the city of Aventicum in Switzerland, and also about the, the context of the discovery of the gold bust of Marcus Aurelius in the late 30s in, a, in Avanche. The, um, the city of Avanche, ancient Aventicum, is situated more or less in the central part of the Swiss plateau, in between the Jura Range and the Alps. And um, it, it was uh, on a number of uh, communication wards uh, during antiquity. The, this was the central part also of the territory of a, of a Celtic tribe, the Helvetii, uh, which were occupying most of the Swiss plateau in the first century BC and in later in the Roman period. I will provide you with a few chronological elements now, and to which I will come back progressively during the, the lecture, but just to give you a few insights into the, um, the chronology and the, the evolution of uh, Avanche. During the second and first century BC, uh, Avanche was a Celtic settlement. I will come back to it la later. And in 15 BC, all the territory of the Helvetii tribe was integrated within the Roman Empire. Uh, and Avanche at that time became, the, in, in Latin, the Caput Kiritas, the, the capital city, the administrative center of the, um, the Helvetii within the, the Roman Empire, and it was part at that time of the, 
the province of uh, um, uh, Gallia Belgica. Later on, in the first century, around 69-70, the Emperor Vespasian uh, gave the status of Colonia to the city of Aventicum. It became then the Colonia Pia Flavia Constance Emerita Helvetiorum Federata. And shortly afterwards, it was transferred into a, into a newly created province, which is called Germania Superior. Um, Shortly after obtaining the status of Colonia, the, the, the city saw the construction of, the, of its rampart, and by the end of the century, the construction of the Sigonier Sanctuary, in which the golden bust was found, and I will also come back to it, to it later. By the beginning of the second century, uh, the town saw the construction of the theater and the amphitheater, and by the mid-late third century, the, the city witnessed the first Germanic invasion, especially by the Alemanni tribe, and it starts the decline of the, the city. The city has really been thriving in the second and early third century, and afterwards, since the 60s, 70s of the third century, there is a slow decline in the, in the city, which is progressively abandoned during the fourth century. And by the early Middle Age, by the 6th century, it is still just big enough to, to become the seat of an Episcopal See. But at the end of the same century, the Episcopal See is moved to another city, to Lausanne, further to the, to the south. And it is marked really the, the end of the, the ancient city of, uh, of Avanche. Later on, it will be uh, reoccupied uh, during the medieval period, but that's completely out of the, my lecture today, and I will really concentrate on the first three centuries AD, during the, the time during which the, the city was thriving. The, um, the city of Avanche has been the subject of archaeological research or uh, epigraphic research since the, um, the 17th century. Here we can see a, 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 a drawing, which is the first published recording of some of the antiquities from Avanche with a standing column or pillar with a nest of stork on top of it. That's the, the column which has become known as the Sigonier, the Sigonier in, uh, means the, the, the place with the nest of the stork, and uh, that's the place where the golden bust was found. During all the, um, the 18th century, excavations were going on in Avanche, sometimes excavations, sometimes more looting, and it's during that century that most of the nicest mosaics were found in Avanche. These have all been lost and destroyed afterwards, but we do keep some recording of these mosaics, like this one, excavated in 1737. It's a mosaic with a representation of Bellerophon that has been drawn and uh, painted exactly as it was and keep the, the record of this, uh, this exceptional piece of mosaic. In the later, uh, 18th century, research starts to be better organized, and the authorities of Bern send an architect, Erasmus Ritter, to Avanche to record the ancient monuments, to draw the, to draw the plan, and to study the, uh, the city. That's something very exceptional so early in the um, in, uh, in, in our history in Switzerland to have uh, someone send officially to record archaeological um, uh, monuments uh, at, uh, in, uh, in a site. And this is not the first plan of the ancient city of Avanche. That's the one from the, the end of the 18th century by Erasmus Ritter. There were other ones previously, but that's certainly the most detailed. And uh, it's probably a bit small, but you can see that that's the, the hill with the medieval town. Here is the, an amphitheater. Here is a theater. And on different places, there are ruins that are dis shortly described, and especially clear on this plan is the city wall, the Roman city wall of uh, Avanche. The Erasmus Ritter also recorded in detail some of the standing monuments, including the, 
the, the pillar or the column of the, the Sigonier, which is here included in a reconstruction of what he, he thought was the, the monuments to which it belonged. And he, 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 he made it in, in his restitution as he, it was the gate uh, or some sort of monument and arch uh, leading to the forum. He also studied the standing remains of the amphitheater and other monuments. Uh, roughly at the, the same time, we also had a, an Englishman, Lord Spencer Compton, Earl of, Earl of Northampton, who came to Avanche and who stayed for more than a decade in the city with his family and started excavating the Roman remains. He's the one who uncovered this very famous mosaic, the mosaic of the winds, and he hired a, a painter from Fribourg, the, the nearby town, Joseph Emmanuel Curti, who did recorded drawing and painting all his finds. So for instance, here, the excavation of a public bus uh, with a drawing of the system for eating the, 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 um, the, the warm rooms of the, of the bus, but especially this, uh, this drawing. This is a, a, a photo of the original drawing by jo Joseph Emmanuel Curti. And until very recently, we were aware of two other copies. This one is uh, kept uh, in the library of the, or the, the archives in Fribourg. Uh, the other two are kept in libraries in Bern and Zurich, and they are later copies. But in 2019, when I, I started talking about the ex exhibition about the, the gold bust, Jeffrey Spear, the curator of antiquities of the Getty Villa, uh, showed me other copies that are kept at the, in the collection of the Getty Center. And these are the two copies of mosaics, the mosaic of the wind and another one, that are kept at the, the Getty, that are coming from the, a private collection from an Austrian or German aristocrat that is not other known uh, apart for, from this. But then the, um, the copies that are in the Getty and that are in the exhibition now are very interesting because I think they are quite early and probably already from the hand of Joseph Emmanuel Curti. At that time, there was no scanner, no photocopy, and the only way to reproduce these uh, uh, mosaics was just to, to draw and paint them again based on the original drawing. Uh, f further on, the, in the 19th century, the, the research tried to be a bit more organized in, uh, in Avanche. In 1822, the, the government of the canton of Vaux, which was by then independent from Bern, uh, appointed a curator of the antiquities of Avanche, François Rodolphe de Dompierre. He has been the first curator, he is the one who created the, the Museum of Avanche in 1838. The museum opened in that tower, which is a tower dating back to the 11th century, uh, which has been built by that time uh, over the remains of the, um, the amphitheater. It's an historical building, it's very nice, uh, but it's not really what, will, what is convenient for a modern museum. But unfortunately, the Museum of Avanche is still more than 180 years later, is still in this tower. It has been modernized, but then, and as you can see, that's the second floor. Uh, with the golden bust of Marcus Aurelius, but for security, security reason, we can't uh, have the original one in the museum, and it's a copy that is on display. The original one is visible at the Villa Getty now, uh, and it's certainly one of the very few uh, opportunity to see it. Since its discovery, the, the bust has been uh, on display on loan five times in Switzerland, and five times in uh, other European countries. So this is, this is the sixth international loan of the, the Golden Bust, and it's the first time that it's crossing the, the ocean to come to another continent. 
uh, by the end of the 19th century, was created the Association Pro Aventico in 1885, exactly, which, was be, which has been created to protect the winds and to, to investigate them more professionally. During all the, the 19th century, some of the monuments, especially the, the, thea the theater, suffered uh, enormously from looting, and these were considered as uh, uh, extraordinary uh, sources, quarries of building materials, and the people were destroying the theater, and s the people from Avanche, and selling the stone in all the wider area of Avanche to build other uh, uh, construction houses and farms with the Roman stones. By the end of the 19th century, the, the Associ Association Pro Aventico managed to put a hand to this practice, and soon afterwards, the, the association started uh, excavation and restoration projects on the different monuments. They started by the, the city wall, the rampart is the excavation of the ditch in front of the rampart or the restoration of the rampart itself. And since uh, the end of the 19th century, the, the, association, the association is publishing every year a scientific journal called the Bulletin de l'Association Pro Aventico, reporting about the research and excavation in, uh, in Avanche. So Avanche has become an extremely well-documented site. Uh, after the, um, the, the, the city wall, it's the theater that has been excavated and restored during the course of several seasons or campaigns during all the first half of the, of the 20th century. And all this research, and including the current research, the, the, the uh, institution sit uh, a Musée Romain d'Avanche, the research center and uh, museum in uh, Roman Museum in Avanche, is a, is a state-funded uh, institution, and we are still in charge of all the excavation, uh, conservation, restoration work, research, publication, and also exhibition in the museum. So we, we are doing all these activities with a, with a rather large team, and the site, the site of Avanche is very well known. Here, a plan of the, of the town with all the, the different periods that are mixed, that's mean all the monuments from the first to the third century on the same plan. I will come back to the chronology later, and you can see the, the city wall, the rampart, that is enclosing an area of 230, 230 hectares or 568 acres. And well, it includes areas that were never built, that are rather hilly, and the town itself, uh, which extends in the plain to the, to the north uh, east of that hill. This is a geological hill that is uh, on, on top of which the, the medieval town was built. And you can see the, the city itself with, with its regular grid of streets crossing at wide angles, the forum in the center, the theater, the sanctuary of the Sigoni, which is part of what we call the Western religious uh, precinct, which includes all the temples, or most of the temples of the, the city. There is also one in the, in the Forum and another two in a, in a suburban sanctuary. But also the, the amphitheaters and the main gates of the, of the town. On the, on the photo to the, to the left, a view of the, of the town where in the first uh, uh, ground the eastern gate, and then really the area where the Roman city extends. That very green field uh, is covering the forum. You, can, can, you can't really see it, but you can imagine the theater here. You can see here the, the, the 11th century tower hosting the museum that is just beside the amphitheater. And as you can see, most of the Roman city, that means all this part of the Roman city, is in uh, agricultural lands. It's protected, these are lands that are uh, completely protected by the state, by the law. The, most of them have been bought by the, by the state, and it's impossible to build on this land. But on the other side, all the northern uh, area 
of the, the town, is un of, of the woman city, is under the modern town, and it's in this industrial area. There are construction work every year, and therefore, archaeological excavation, rescue excavation, also every year. I will now come back little in time, uh, to the end of the 30s, at the time where we had this very first large excavation that were conducted scientifically. And that's the excavation of the sanctuary of the Sigonier between 1938 and 1940. This was led by Louis Bosset, which was first and foremost an architect working as an archaeologist, and he decided to uh, excavate the area around what we, we, we call the colon of the Sigonier, that's mean this, this pillar that, wa that was already on, on the very first published drawing of the site by Matthäus Merian in, uh, in the 17th century with the, with the stork nest on top of it. Uh, the, the, um, the pillar has always been standing alone like this. It has not been restored or re-erected. You can see a view of the, the excavation in 1938. Uh, when he started the excavation, Louis Bosset was not really sure uh, what the what, which kind of remains he will, he will find. Uh, and most of the scholars were thinking it's the forum that should be located around the, 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 the pillar of the, the Sigonier. The, the excavation that was run by Louis Bosset was something quite special in the, in the late 30s, the time where well, there, there was an economic crisis, and it has been organized as a... As, a, as an excavation intended to provide uh, an occupation, a job, to uh, unemployed people from Lausanne in uh, 1938 and 1939. And then later on, in, the, in, the 40, in uh, 1940, the, the workers that were employed on these excavations were French soldiers that were interned in Switzerland at the beginning of World War II. Some of the workers uh, at work here uh, on the excavation or during the, the lunch break, and a reconstruction of the sanctuary by Louis Bosset uh, in, done in 1940 at the end of his excavations. The, um, it, it's, a, it's a reconstruction, and what, what he excavated, he realized, was a temple and well, a temple within a sanctuary. But unfortunately, Louis Bosset never released to died his finds. Then after the excavation, he, he let all the files aside and went to, to other projects. And it's only by the, the, in the second half of the 1970s that an archaeologist, Philip Bridel, took over the, 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 the files on these excavations did a complete archaeological and architectural study of the monuments and published it in 1982. So the, the sanctuary of the, the Sigonier is here, and it's in what we call it this wider area that we call the, the Western religious precinct. So just beside it are two other temples, the temples of the Lavoie, but also in front of the, uh, the sanctuary, the theater. And the theater, and the, the sanctuary are part of the same architectural program that was started in 98 AD. Here is the plan of the, plan of the sanctuary itself, with the, set, the temple in the center. It's a typical Roman temple with a kela and a porch in front, uh, and a colonnaded porch in front. But it's surrounded by a huge courtyard uh, with porticos along its side, and the courtyard is closed to the, to the south just by a low wall to face that open space in between the theater and, um, and the sanctuary. Here are two reconstructions of the, the sanctuary, the one by uh, Philippe Bridel in the early 80s, and, uh, and another one by one of our collaborators, Bernard Raymond, uh, and just to give you an idea of the size of that monument. That's the temple itself, and if we look in more details at this architecture, it's very reminiscent of a monument 
in Rome, the Forum Pacis, which was built by uh, Emperor Vespasian uh, shortly after the, the Jewish War uh, as a monument of, to celebrate his, uh, his, his victory in, in a Near East. And certainly the sanctuary of the Sigonier was architecturally planned in the 70s or 80s based on the Forum Pacis in Rome, and then the construction work started in 98 AD uh, in Avanche. And to, to give you the, uh, an idea of the, the size of the monument, uh, the, the, the size of it on, on the previous page, you imagine uh, a temple that is 35 by 27, 27 meters wide and long, over 20 meters high, and um, the, the wall sanctuary, including the courtyard and porticos, extending to 106 meters by 76 meters. So it's a huge building. And it, it, it's also a building that was very nicely uh, decorated. Here are some details of the, the carving on the cornices of the, the temple from the front facade. But during that excavation, on the 20th of April, 1939, the workers did an extraordinary discovery. They were cleaning um, a sewage pipe, a sewage conduit that was underground, that was crossing the courtyard of the sanctuary from west to east. Uh, it's a big conduit, it's almost like an underground aqueduct. And when cleaning the inside, which, which was just full of soil, and they were complaining that there was no artifacts or anything left in that conduit, which is not very surprising, because usually when we excavate uh, aqueducts or uh, water channel, we don't get much uh, artifacts. But on that fine day of uh, 20th of April, 39, they found the golden bust inside the, um, the conduit. These are the photos taken shortly after the, the discovery. They put it back to the soil and took the photograph with the workers, then bringing it to the, to the, um, the, 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 the guy that was the chief of the, the excavation. Uh, so not immediately, but just after the, the discovery. And this is the, the gold bust that I imagine most of you saw in the exhibition or will see uh, shortly after this, uh, this lecture. That's the first exhibition of the bust around the, the, the face of a barn in Avanche in a, in a, in a little showcase. Uh, it was exposed for a few days in Avanche until they realized it's perhaps a bit dangerous and then they send it to, to Lausanne and keep it in a, in a, in a safe, in a bank, uh, where it has stayed until now. No, it, it went out for some time for uh, exhibition, but also for restoration. The golden bust is uh, made in a single sheet of gold. It weighs after the, um, the, 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 the cleaning and restoration, uh, one kilo, 589 uh, kilos, uh, that is 3.5 uh, pounds. And it's 30.5 centimeters high. The, the work has been done in repoussé. It's a very, very fine uh, work, especially if you consider that it's a single sheet of gold. There were no trace, all the analysis, analysis were, were done, there are absolutely no trace that several sheets were used and put to, together. Uh, immediately after the, the discovery, the, the main question was, who is it representing? It's in gold, and during the Roman period, gold was a privilege for portraits, was a privilege of the emperors. All the emperors of the first century are always represented without a bird. The emperors of the third century sometimes were a bird, sometimes not, but usually very short birds. And the rather long bird that you can see on this face is typical of the second century. The, the first emperor who had a bird was uh, Adrian, then uh, the second one was uh, Antoninus Pius, and the third one was Marcus Aurelius. 
And for, uh, fortunately, there are other portraits of the emperors of the second century. And by comparing the golden bust with uh, other portraits, uh, the, the, the archaeologist first thought it might be Antoninus Pius. But further comparison, especially with our other bust, pointed out to the identification with Marcus Aurelius, which is still widely accepted now. It has just been a time in the early 80s where a Belgian colleague, uh, Jean-Charles Balti, challenged this identification and proposed it's rather Julian the Apostate. But this, has, this identification has been rejected. And if you compare with other portraits of Marcus Aurelius, either young or older, the, the similarity is, is striking. And we are now 100% sure it is Marcus Aurelius. The, um, the portrait was probably drawn at the end of the, the, his reign during the years 176 to 180 uh, AD. On this representation, he is wearing three layers of, uh, of clothes. First, uh, a tunica, then an armor of, a, of an Hellenistic type, the Lorica plumata, with a gorgonian in the in the middle, reminiscent of, for instance, the, the armor of Alexander the Great and uh, further kings and emperors uh, in, uh, during antiquity. And over the, the armor is wearing a coat called pal paludamentum in, uh, in Latin that was old on the shoulder by a fibula. It uh, is a... Um, uh, elements that the Romans were using to, to maintain the, 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 the closest together. And this fibula was not in gold, it was in uh, iron, and it le leaves that trace of rust on the, on the golden bust. We know only of two other golden bust from the Roman period. One is a portrait of Septimius Severus that was found in Greece in uh, Didymoteichon in the 1960s. Uh, and the other one is a, is a later one. It's preserved in a, in a ninth century reliquary uh, representing Saint Foy of Conques uh, in France, in southern France. And in the ninth century, when they first built the reliquary, they used the head of, of a Roman emperor, an unknown Roman emperor of the fourth century, to integrate into the, into the, the stat statue. And then, of course, for the Roman period, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, the early empire, we know many other portraits, but that are either in stone, marble, or silver, like this portrait of uh, Lucius Verus. So the discovery in Avanche was the first one of its kind. And well, if we compare the, the quality of these different golden busts, it's certainly the finest one. Uh, uh, what about the function of that golden bust? Well, there have been different hypotheses, and probably the most likely one is that uh, it was originally used as a, an imago. An imago is a, as a portrait of the emperor, the current emperor, that was held by a soldier in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Roman legions. They all, always had the, the insignias of the le legions, and they had the portrait of the emperor. And here are two stele, a funerary stele found in Germany, another one from uh, Italy, showing legionaries holding the imago. Th these soldiers had a special name. They were called uh, an imaginifer, that's been the one holding the portrait of the, the emperor. And it's likely that the, the golden bust was first produced to be an imago for the army, but then later on, its function changed. If you see, look at the details on the side of the, the bust in its lower part, there are small holes that were uh, uh, done to, to insert rivet. And at some point, the, the bust was fixed with these rivets on a wooden element. Whether it was 
the pole of the, uh, the imago, or whether it was something different. But anyway, given the place where it has been found, there is absolutely no link with the Roman military. Avanche, Aventicum, has never been uh, a garrison city. There, there were one excep exception, to which I, I, I shall come back later. But there, were, there were no soldiers in Avanche. Uh, there, there were no uh, military units. And providing the, that the bust was found in a sanctuary, it's more likely that it was related to the, to the sanctuary somehow. Why was it found in a sewage pipe? Probably because at some point in the third century, perhaps in the second half of the third century, during the barbarian invasions, the, um, the treasure of the sanctuary was hidden in these pipes, and then after everything was taken over and the burst was forgotten in the, in the pipe. And this will give some weight to the, the, the golden burst being then later on in the second and third century part of the treasure of the sanctuary. Of course, we know very little about the, the treasures of the sanctuaries in Roman Gaul or Germania. Uh, there is one example in, uh, in, in Burgundy in France with a, with a very rich um, uh, sanctuary's treasures that has been looted in, uh, in the 70s, including statues, silver statues of the gods uh, worshipped in the, in the sanctuary. And it might be that the, the golden bust indicates that the, um, one of the deities worshipped in the, in the sanctuary was the emperor, it was the, the imperial cult. But there were also other deities. Here are a chapiteau of the later second century or early third century, uh, which was somewhere in the porticos of the, the sanctuary, bearing a dedication to a group of uh, uh, Celtic deities, the Lugoves, or a an altar found during the excavation dedicated to Mars Catterix, which is a, a Gallo-Roman um, god with a Roman name and a Celtic name. And this is a, a, a god, Mars Catterix, that is uh, attested by at least 10 inscriptions. And all these inscriptions were found within the territory of the Helvetii. So it's a typical uh, god of the Helvetii. And these are uh, one group of deities and one god that were probably also worshipped in, the, in that sanctuary. But given the size of the sanctuary, the way it is planned together with the theater, uh, the sanctuary of the Sigonier was the main sanctuary and the main temple in the, in the city. And it was certainly there that the, the deities that were protecting uh, Aventicum were worshipped and also the, the emperor, the imperial cult. And we know of uh, another deity uh, that we would like to situate within that sanctuary, but unfortunately, all the inscriptions that were found referring to this goddess, it's the Dea Aventia, she's bearing the name of the town. The uh, Aventicum is de derived from Aventia. It was probably a goddess uh, related with water, with the springs. And this Dea Aventia is known by a series of monumental inscriptions that unfortunately were all found in secondary, uh, if not tertiary position uh, in, uh, in Avanche or in the surrounding villages. But here are two examples of the dedication to this goddess and also in honor of some of the, the inhabitants of the, the town. Here, for instance, with these two inscriptions, these are freedmen that were holding official political duties in, uh, in the city. I'm going now back to the, to the roots of the, the city of, uh, of Aventicum, and especially to its Celtic origin. For a very long time, until probably a, 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 until the beginning of the, 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 the years 2000, 
2010, we were considering Avanche Aventicum as an ex nihilo creation in 15 BC when the territory of the Helveti was integrated within the Roman Empire. Uh, of course, there were some discoveries that were done earlier that were giving some insight into a previous occupation. And for instance, in 92 and 96, uh, uh, cremation uh, burials were found that belonged to the first century BC. And also, in uh, 1998, while excavating one of the temples, the, the one temple of the sanctuary of the Grange des Dîmes, two burials uh, dating back to the second or early first century BC were excavated. And these are the, 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 the deceased are in a very peculiar position because they are in a seated position. And that's something that is also attested elsewhere in pre-Roman Gaul. It's a Celtic uh, tradition uh, for uh, burials that are done in a religious context within sanctuaries, whether it's related to the, to the cult of the heroes or the ancestor. But this gave insight into a, a previous Celtic occupation. But uh, fortunately, during a series of excavations that started in 2014 and that lasted until last year, we had been lucky enough to excavate on different points to the south of the hill, which has the, the medieval town. That's when we are really to the west, southwest of the Roman town, partly out of the, the enclosed area. And all these excavations provided uh, ample evidence for a, a, an important settlement during the later second century BC and the first century BC. Just an example of one of these excavations, you can see that's La, La Route du Faubourg in 2014. In the background, uh, excavation of Roman remains, stone walls, that's part of the Roman town. And under the stone walls, pits and post holes, these are all hollow structures, much more difficult to excavate, sometimes very difficult to recognize while excavating. These are elements that have escaped to the attention of our predecessor, uh, but all these pits belong to that uh, Celtic settlement of the first century BC. And, uh, of course, much more difficult to interpret than stone walls that give you very straightforwardly the, the plan of a structure of a building. Uh, but here we are able to reconstruct on the side of a, of a street, uh, different buildings entirely built with light materials, earth and wood. Uh, the, the, the evolution of these buildings that were built in, in that way along that street. And that's the settlement of the, the Celtic, the late Iron Age Celtic period. And amongst the material we found in all these pits and post holes uh, are, is a very fragmentary and poorly preserved artifacts. But this gives us anyway ample evidence for uh, an important presence of the Celtic elite on the site, here with weapons elements. Only the, the elite was wearing weapons in the Celtic society, uh, providing us with evidence for uh, harnessing and de de decorations of chariots also part of the, the elite, but also all sorts of, uh, well, I'd say, in industrial production, pottery, uh, iron smithing, etc. but also the presence of a mint since the first half of the first century BC. And we did find molds to produce the flanks that were used to, um, to, um, uh, to, to use with the um, the, the, the dyes to, to produce the, the coins themselves. There are some nice examples of the, the, the bushel uh, type of coins that were produced in the first century uh, BC in the, in the region of Avanche, but also fine scales that were used to, to weight the, the coins. And if the 
the, the, the city was, or the, 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 well, I'd say the settlement uh, in Avanche was producing, was uh, having a meat and was producing corns. That means it had uh, an administrative and political role. And it was certainly one of the main cities of the, or well, one, of the, well, one of the main cities of the Helvetii before the Roman period, if not one or the capital of these Celtic tribes before the integration in the, in the Roman Empire. But the, the artifacts we found in all these excavations are also providing us with completely new uh, elements about the movements of population uh, at the turn of the second, first century BC. We know by the, 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 the Roman um, historians that the, the, the Celtic people were moving. Uh, we, we've got very precise descriptions by Julius Caesar of the um, migration of the Helvetii in 58 BC. But the material we found in Avanche with many goods that were imported from what is now well, the Danubian area, what is now southern Germany, Bavaria, uh, give us some very good clues to population movements probably in the two first decades of the first century BC from southern Germany, well, what is now southern Germany, towards the Swiss plateau. And later on, so probably that's when the Helvetii arrived on the Swiss plateau, and later on, they were probably not that happy in that era. And in 58, they decided to emigrate again towards the, the Saintonge, the area where just north of Bordeaux in southern France. And that's what prompted Julius Caesar to um, is military intervention. And the Helvets first moved towards Geneva. Caesar blocked them in Geneva. They went back, crossed the, the Jura mountain closer to Avanche, and went to, to Bibracte in Burgundy, where Caesar again inflict them, inflicted them a, a defeat and sent them back to the, to the Swiss plateau, where Apparently, they stayed afterwards, and when the Roman uh, Empire extended on that part of the, 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 um, the on that part of Gaul, the, the Helvetii were still on the on the Swiss plateau, and they created their administrative center and area there. And that's what brings me to the area of the creation of the Roman town. So it's no more an ex nihilo foundation. It's what I would rather call a re-foundation. That means in 15 BC, when the area was integrated within the Roman Empire, the city, the settlement, was moved from west to east. They went to the north uh, east of that hill, where the plain is more extended and where the LVT of the Roman period were able to build their city according to Roman urbanism. At first, at the turn of the era, the, the, the city of Avanche uh, received the, um, its grid of streets crossing at right angles, defining uh, quarters, called insula, insulae, in plural, in, uh, in Latin, with a forum in the center. And some areas where we know there will be the, the, the religious part will be further developed. But at that time, no one part, no other elements la, like this. And um, here is a more detailed plan. So that's, uh, again, the plan with all the elements from the first to the third century. But what has been excavated on several points of the town is a ditch, which is exactly square, and which is apparently enclosing the first part of the town. There are some view of this ditch, which was dug in the Augustan period, the turn of the era, which is probably the first symbolic limit of the, of the city. And within that city, 
within the, um, the grid defined by the, by the streets. In the center was built a forum of which we know, in fact, very little. There were some excavations in the 18th and 19th century. There were just some exploratory trenches in the 20th century, but most of what we know about the forum is uh, due to geophysical surveys. Uh, but it's enough to provide us with a plan that is also uh, asserted by comparisons with other uh, fora forum in, uh, in the neighboring provinces. And uh, the forum included a, a, a secret area with a temple, of which we know absolutely nothing, if just that the, the, the podium of the temple was destroyed in the 19th century to, to take uh, building uh, materials, uh, uh, an area publica, uh, the, 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 the public uh, area where everything was going on about commercial activities and political activities, which also took place in the basilica, uh, specific, uh, a large building specifically intended for legal and political uh, affairs. And a tentative reconstruction of this forum. Don't take it for granted, we haven't excavated enough. But all the other reconstruction I've shown you and I will show you later are based on detailed archaeological and architectural studies and are rather certain. In, uh, in the, the first two or three decades of the first century AD, the, the different quarters, the, the insulae, were built with houses, small houses, large houses, that were systematically built with large material, usually a very thin, small basement, and then horizontal wooden beams. That's the same walls, a different stage of the excavation. It's this one on the, on the plan. And then uh, elevation walls that were uh, built with wattle and daub. That's the Roman houses of the early first century, but were properly excavated. We do have, e we do have enough information to have reconstructed plans of these uh, buildings. But soon afterwards, from the 40s uh, of the first century AD, people started to build more relying on stone, uh, or at least the, the foundations and the basements of the walls were in stone, and the upper part was either in mud brick or wattle and daub. But then very quickly also the, the houses changed their, their plans, and the people adopted the Mediterranean Italian plans for their houses. That's the case with this house in the Insula uh, 12, which was built between 41 and 54, uh, with a very nice uh, peristyle with a Tuscan order uh, portico. And so that's already typical from Roman Italy, and uh, the Helvetii from Avanche adopted very quickly the, the habits of the, the Romans or to most of the, 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 the inhabitants of the town were uh, indigenous people. There, there, was, there, were, there was no migration from Italy towards the, the Swiss plateau. Uh, a second step in the development of the town is uh, in the Flavian period. And that's the time at the end of the civil war, we saw the, the year of the four emperors with uh, Galba, Autonius, Vitellius, and finally, um, uh, the Vespasian, that um, the, 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 the city uh, received a new impetus. And during the civil war, the, um, uh, the, the territory of the, the Helveti and the, the Helvetian army supported the, um, the, 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 the troops of uh, Vespasian against the... Um, the, um, the troops of Vitellius, which was relying on the Rhine army, and uh, the Helvetii were defeated again. Uh, but afterwards, they were rewa rewarded by uh, Vespasian, who gave the, um, the town a new status, the status of a colonia, becoming now Colonia Pla Flavia 
Constance Emerita Elvetiorum Federata, and that's the highest status a city can have in the Roman period, in the Roman Empire, and this, these uh, colonies are following the Roman law. Uh, some of the, the inhabitants of Avanche be received the, the Roman citizenship before that period, but then from around 70 AD, all the inhabitants were complete Roman citizens. Another recent development in the, in the research of Avanche is the link with the Flavian dynasty. Because uh, it has been thought, well, well yes, the, the Helveti it has supported uh, uh, Vespasian during the civil war, but also the Flavian family had a very close link with, the, with uh, Aventicon. And this is based, or this was based on two, mainly two elements. First, uh, a, a text by Suetonius saying that Flavius Sabinus, the father of v v Vespasian, uh, after having been a tax collector in other parts of the empire, became a banker uh, amongst the Helveti, so probably in Avanche, where he lived, but probably he died around 9 uh, AD. And uh, in, a, in the 19th century, it was found this inscription that has been reconstructed, uh, studied by several scholars, lastly by the Denis van Berchem. And it was reconstructed as being uh, the funerary inscriptions of an educatrix. Uh, an educatrix is uh, somewhat a, a nurse for very small child. And this uh, educatrix is referred to as being the educatrix as Aug N. Augusti Nostri, that means who emperor. And then the historians, very proud of this find, this, this is the funerary stele of uh, Pompeia Gemela, which was the nurse of Titus, the son of Vespasian, who lived in Avanche with his grandfather, Flavius Sabinus. This has been challenged very recently. Last June, I took out the inscription of the museum. Uh, we de-restored part of it. And now I have another reading. There are traces of letters that were not seen by Van Berchem. And uh, so this uh, reading is no more valid. There is still a reference to uh, Augusti Nostri, the Aug N at the end of the inscriptions, but there is no more, it's no more the educatrix of the emperor. And another point that we're not very happy about was the DM at the beginning of the inscription. That's this, this manibus, it's uh, to, the, to the gods of the deceased. And this is something that is typically used in the Swiss plateau in the Roman period in the second and third century, but not in the first century. So this is very likely a second century inscription. There is, as inscription, there is still a link with the royal, with the um, uh, imperial court, Augusti Nostri, but no more with the Flavians. The Flavians were not that familiar with Avanche, but they anyway uh, give it the status of the, the colonia. And immediately after receiving this status, the, um, the city built the rampart wall around the town. This rampart is very well dated because in part of its circuit, the, um, the, the swampy terrain uh, soil around Avanche is not strong enough to support the foundation. And they used a um, uh, wooden post oak posts to reinforce the soil before building the foundations. And with dendrochronology, these posts are dated very precisely. The earliest one dates back to 68 AD, but the huge majority of them are dated between 72 and 76. Just here, a funerary inscriptions of a Roman legionary with two of these that died in Avanche in the very early 70s, and these were probably legionaries that were employed in the building or in relation with the building of the rampart. It's also in the Flavian period and in the afterwards of the Flavian period that the Western religious precinct developed. Uh, here, more detailed plan of this, uh, this era, the sanctuary of the Sigonier, the two Roman temple of the Lavoie, 
the sanctuary of the Grange des Dîmes with another two temples, the sanctuary derrière la tour with one temple, but we do uh, start to have good evidence of a second one behind it, so that where most of the temples of the area of, of Avanche were concentrated, and some examples of the, the deities that were worshipped in that era, although none of these inscriptions was found uh, in situ, a dedication to Mercury Sisolius, another Gallo Roman temple having a Latin name and a Celtic name, or an entirely Celtic goddess, Aneclomara. Uh, here, dedication to Aneclomara and the uh, emperor. The sanctuary of the, the Grange des Dîmes was excavated over several campaigns. Here are the remains as they appear now in the modern town of Avanche. And these are very special. This sanctuary includes two temples that are very special. And just very shortly here, to show you a typical or classic Roman temple built on a podium with a rectangular cella and a porch with columns. And a Gallo-Roman temple with a square cella that is surrounded by a gallery, by a portico. And these are found everywhere through the, 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 the Gallic and Germanic provinces. But the, the, the two temples in the sanctuary of the, the Grange des Dîmes are a real mix between these two traditions. The first one, the square one, was built as a Gallo, like a Gallo-Roman temple with a square cella and a, and a square gallery around it, but then it was built on top of a high podium with a porch in front of it. And it's here really a synthesis of the two traditions, and the inhabitants wanted to keep the properly Celtic plan of the temple, but give it the attributes of a Roman temple from uh, Italy, and it also includes uh, an attic, a low wall on top of the gallery, uh, including shields with representation of gods. Here it's a, a rep representation of uh, Achelos, and that all is very reminiscent of the Forum Pacis built in the beginning of the first century AD in Rome. The other temple uh, follow the same principle with a, a, a podium, then a circular kella, a polygonal gallery around it. And how do we reconstruct this? It's because we do have quite a lot of architectural elements that were found during excavation, providing us elements about the elevation. The, third and the second and third century is really the time when Avanche will be a thriving city. Uh, and it's at that time that most of the other large monuments were built, including the theater in front of the sanctuary of the Sigonier, built in the beginning of the second century. It's one of the largest Roman theaters north of the Alps, with a typical Roman plan, it's a, a semicircular plan, but it has no wall behind the scene, like the theaters in Italy or in southern Gaul, meaning for a theater of orange that is very well preserved. This one is completely open with just a tiny building behind uh, the stage, and it's open towards the sanctuary of the Sigonier, and these two were certainly meant to function together. The, um, the theater being used for religious ceremonies to host the, the inhabitants of the town during religious and political ceremony. And this theater was able to, uh, to, to, to uh, um, admit 20, up to 20, uh, 12,000 spectators. The amphitheater is another of the building of the town that, is quite, that was quite well preserved, but also has been heavily restored in the first half or middle of the 20th century, here during the excavation. Uh, it witnessed two phases. The first phase is in the 20s of the second century, building a first amphitheater, rather simple, large, but rather simple, no peculiar decoration. And in the second half of the same century, the uh, theater was made much bigger, uh, slightly 
uh, extended in uh, diameter, but all the, um, the, the, the walls of tears were destroyed, were be rebuilt with a steeper angle, and being able to hold up to 16,000 spectators. The, um, that's also the period, the second and beginning of the third century, where the different quarters of the town attain much of their development, uh, with the insula, just one example, insula, 13, close to the, to the religious precinct, with this very, the plan after the excavation and the reconstruction of the, the, the house in its eastern part, which is a very large house organized around a garden and a portico with a pool, again, very typical of Roman Italy. The, the habits were completely adopted by the, the Helvetii. Or another example, very impressive, which is no more uh, what we would call uh, an urban house. It's more like a palace, and it follows the, um, the architectural plans of the rural, the largest rural villas that were built north of the Alps. And uh, this, the development of this complex started in the late first century AD, but it's really at the beginning of the third century that it attained its uh, most extensive development, uh, including huge garden and porticos and different ales. Here, our construction that is quite certain of that structure. And uh, it's in this building that was found in, or in a part of this uh, palace, that was found in the 19th century, the, this sculpture with the, um, the she-wolves feeding the twins, Romulus and Remulus. Uh, that's the, the legend of the foundation of Rome. And that shows the link with Rome of the family that was living there, which was almost certainly, based on epigraphical evidence, the family of the Otacili, which is one of the prominent families in Avanche in the second and third centuries. It is a family with Italian origins, and here the largest inscription that was recovered in Avanche in honor of one of the members of that Otacili family. But the huge majority of the inhabitants and of the elites in Avanche were indigenous. And here is another example. These are two inscriptions that are in the exhibition, in the gallery, together with the gold bust. Uh, inscriptions that are dedication to prominent members of the Camilli family. The Camilli family is a Celtic family that was in the region of Avanche and uh, the region of Yverdon at least since the, the mid-first century BC, one of its, um, uh, the, 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 the first uh, person of that family that is known is referred to by the historians and is the one who, who catch one of the, the uh, one of the person who assassinated Julius Caesar when he tried to flee so, toward Germania. But then in the early first century BC, uh, f f early first century AD, this uh, people from the Camille family became very quickly Romanized, and these two persons were already Roman citizens in the first half of the century before the Avanche received the status of uh, colonials, and they were active very widely. The first one is honored by the, by the old Helveti and by the Edri, which is uh, another Celtic tribe uh, which was based on current Burgundy in, uh, in France. Uh, that means he has been active probably for commercial reasons uh, in, uh, in Gaul. And the, the other one has been a military tribune in one of the, the le legion, in the le uh, Legio Quarta Macedonica. And uh, he participated to the conquest of Britain uh, in the first half of the first century. So these were just a few words about this local Roman elites with Celtic origin that were really the, the, the people who make uh, Aventicum a thriving city through the second and first half of the third century.
And here, to conclude, uh, our construction of the, the city of Avanche at its height in the later second century AD. It's a, a, a city that was probably um, having around 20,000 inhabitants. Uh, We've done large excavations, but much more remain to be done, and this picture will certainly change in, uh, in the future. But I will conclude here. Thank you for your attention.